Okay, my little geographers. We're going to get into some hardcore nerdy stuff now. Previously, I've just been getting into some big conceptual things, but now we're going to get into the real science behind mapping out the Earth. Right? That's the, um, that's the key thing. It can be too nerdy. Uh, it can it can make you kind of your eyes glaze over and and all that stuff. But it is important since we're going to be dealing with maps in this class, using them, you know, making them, reading them, all that kind of stuff. It's important to understand this very basic concept how these things work. So geodesy is this subcomponent of geography. It's the science dealing with the measurement of the shape of and locations on the earth. Right? Sounds pretty straightforward. Sounds kind of kind of dumb and boring like all the good stuff's been been done. We kind of figured this out a while ago. Right? Is is kind of your first thought here, but honestly, it's it's amazing what we still are figuring out about like the shape of the earth and, and all of that. The, the people who work in geodesy are brilliant. Uh, and you, you realize you kinda, you have to be because we're dealing with the earth. Like dealing with the shape of something and locations on something, like this desk at which I am sitting, really easy to pull out that tape measure and, and do that kind of stuff. Um, the earth, not so easy because we don't have a tape measure that big, right? It's a gigantic place. So there's a lot of you know, math and, and stuff, kind of, you know, theoretical and logical ways of figuring this stuff out. So that's why it is such a challenging and impressive field. Um, but this, and I, I would much rather be in class um, with you guys. We could have this more, you know, interactive here. But what I always ask students when I start talking about geodesy is, hey, what shape is the earth? And what happens? Like, I've, I've done this long enough. I don't even really need you guys because I know how it would work in the classroom. It is like, you know, a big chunk of you, the vast majority of you would 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 shout out, you know, round or sphere, which is sphere is just you trying to sound like more sciencey than round, because round kind of sounds, you know, like something a child would say, but sphere, that's what a man of science says, right? So you say sphere, like one or two people would say square or flat, just to just to be crazy. Uh, and, and the sad thing is all of you be horribly wrong. And I, of course, would start letting you know how horribly wrong you are. I always, whenever I'm in a classroom, it's always a safe learning environment. But my God, ugh, none of you students really know what's going on. And it's not your fault. It's this cat's fault right here, right? Who are we, who are we looking at? Kind of hard to, to see. Uh, this is Columbus. Um, this uh, picture I took, they charged you to walk past those columns this is in the Caribbean. They charge you to, to walk past the, the columns and uh, I am paying for Columbus, that chump. Um, eh, not worth it. So I, I took it from uh, afar um, right there. But but what Columbus did, right? And that's, you know, and I ask you guys, what do you do? And, and what we say is that Columbus, man, this guy, so smart. He, man, so everybody, this is back in 1492, you see all the ocean blue. The, the whole deal is back in 1492, every single human walked around terrified of falling off the edge of the earth because they were so dumb. And they thought the earth was flat, uh, and, and, you know, and all that. But Columbus, my guy, he was like, no, it is round, right? That's my old Italian thing. It sounds like Dracula. I don't know. But, but that's what he said, right? And was like, Columbus, you crazy. Uh, and he's like, no, give me some boats and, I, and I'll show you. And so he gets some boats and, and there's stories of like his, his crew members, you know, as they're sailing to try to get around the world, crew members are abandoning ship because they're terrified that they're going to fall off the edge of the earth. But Columbus, you know, he was right. And sure, he, you know, had some oopsies. He hit the Bahamas, thought it was India, named them Indians, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, we all... We all make mistakes. How was he supposed to know that there was this big chunk of land uh, uh, right there? Man, what a brilliant guy. That was all nonsense. That is, no, no, no. Right? And it's, uh, again, it's not your fault. It's your kindergarten teacher or whatever. Whoever started you on this path 
Um, I see it with my own kids. I'm always having to correct things, but still have them, you know, give their teachers what they want to hear. Uh, but then I tell them how it actually worked. But anyway, here's the deal. Columbus, no, not a smart guy at all. Not, you know, compared to everybody. Everybody knew the earth was not flat in 1492. People had, you know, roughly 1,500 years at least um, of knowing that the earth was not flat. The Greeks figured this stuff out. All right, and I'll, I'll get into how uh, they, they figured this stuff out. But everybody knew that. It was more a case, like, the reason why nobody would give Columbus ships and send them on this way is because everybody figured out you're going to die. It's too big a deal. Um, and, and Columbus, you know, didn't seem to be, like, the nicest fella uh, and all that. So I think some people just didn't want to give him both, you know, kings and queens because it's like, ah, it's, it's not worth it for me. I don't want to deal with you. I'm just going to, I might as well just set my boats on fire because you're not going to make it back. You're going to die of some horrible disease or be eaten by, you know, whatever. You know, it's not going to work, right? Um, the crew members that jumped ship didn't want to do it. It wasn't because they didn't, you know, they were worried of, of falling off the edge of the earth. No, it's because Columbus was awful. They didn't want to put up with his nonsense anymore. So they just, they bailed. It wasn't worth it to him, right? Um, that's what's going on and and really it's it's also a thing if you actually read columbus's you know journal entries and stuff it is shocking how evil he was like the first thing he does he hits the bahamas and he's running into the indigenous people in these different islands here uh and he's like sweet slaves like right off the bat i mean it's just an instant that i don't know what goes on in your brain um when like i've never met somebody Right? A new person. I've never traveled to another country and, and gone like, oh, nice to meet you. God, you'd make such a good slave. Right? That just doesn't, no, that's not, that's not healthy. But that's what, and not only is he thinking that, he's, you know, he's fine with it. He's writing it down for posterity, right? So that everybody knows, like, hey, I found the slaves. Um, terrible, terrible guy. And, and the idea of the earth being you know, not flat, I'll say. I'll get into why I'm saying that in a moment. Um, the Greeks figured this out, you know, and, and documented it. So that was knowledge here. Um, and, and I say the Greeks are the ones who documented it. Most likely everybody, every human, you know, around the earth, no matter what continent they were on, they figured this stuff out. It's pretty clear if you take just a few minutes to think about it, uh, and keep in mind too, these are people before, you know, smartphones and the internet and TV and, and stuff like that. It's, you know, what, it's kind of like, what else are you going to do? You're just kind of unwinding, you know, as the sun's going down, you can, you can start to notice stuff because that's what you're looking at as opposed to these little screens. So everybody knew this stuff, but the Greeks, they wrote it down and they had stuff like Eratosthenes was this guy who, <clears throat> this is the image that we're looking at here. Um, not only did he, you know, disprove this flat earth concept, but he was able to figure out the size of the earth, the circumference of the earth. And I'm not going to test you on this stuff, but it is just a great story, I think, because like he never had to leave Egypt to, to figure this out, right? Like there's so much we can do just by thinking logically critically about what's going on so it was the idea that we're not going to get into solstices and, and stuff like that um but in the during the june solstice which we in the northern hemisphere think of as the summer solstice roughly june 21st it fluctuates a little bit um but on this day in you know in this specific well here the sun it's directly overhead at solar noon and so it casts no shadows so it's it's hitting the earth perpendicularly right and it's it's the concept that with this well um you know it, it was it was very noticeable because just the whole thing is illuminated because the sun's rays are hitting it directly okay so we've, we've got that going on but at alexandria on the same day at solar noon the um uh the rays aren't hitting at that same angle it's off of 90 by this you know 7.2 degrees so doing some crazy geometry stuff you know you learn all these things about 
which angles are the same if you have, you know, lines that are intersecting and, you know, well, you've gone over all that stuff, right? So what Eratosthenes is able to do um, is able to extend this down into the center of the Earth. So we're assuming it's this perfect 360 degree sphere, right? Um, we, he extends this little wedge down there into the point in which they'll they'll meet at the center, and he figures out, okay, that's that's roughly a fiftieth of a three hundred sixty degree sphere, right? So as long as he just measures that distance between these two points here, multiplies it by fifty, he's able to figure out, you know, not just again, not just that it's a round Earth, um, but that he can figure out that circumference. Right or, or no, you know, circumference the the distance around from one point right back to that same point. So if you started in Alexandria and you just headed north and kept walking and walked over the North Pole and then down and you went down past the South Pole and back up to Alexandria, that's the circumference. You follow, which is roughly twenty five thousand miles. And it was his number. He was off by like three hundred miles or something like that. I mean, it's incredibly accurate considering we have better numbers because we have satellites and space and stuff like that right computers and, and all this stuff he's just sitting around egypt doing some some logical reasoning he figures out how big the earth is that's further proof that columbus wasn't that special because he should have realized that there's no way he went the twenty five thousand miles or whatever that he clearly wasn't bumping in to india but you know that's not the story we tell um, but come on, even that, like this idea of a round earth, is the earth round? Come on, people, is it? Is, is what I would be saying to you people in the, uh, in the classroom. Come on, people. Is it really round? And you'd be like, I don't know at this point because your, your hero Columbus has just been shattered. You don't know what to believe. Look, here's the deal. It's clearly not round. It's not a sphere. It's an oblate spheroid. Duh. Right? You never learned that? In school, oblate spheroid. It means squishy ball. All right, it's just it's uh, squishy. It, it's a it's a sphere. We start out sphere, which and this is what it really comes from the Greeks. Just this assumption of a sphere. They kind of assumed perfection with everything on on the planets and out in the solar system and and all that. Just it, it had to be a perfect three hundred sixty degree sphere. But then Isaac Newton came along, and he's like, hey, it maybe started that way, but it ain't still a sphere. Um, and, and so think, you can think of it as, it's not quite this extreme, but you can think of it as instead of like a basketball, the Earth is more football-shaped, right? Maybe. It's not, it's not that exaggerated. I'll show an image. But it's the idea, and this would be cool if I were in the classroom with you and I had a globe and I could spin it um, to demonstrate this stuff. But it's the idea that the Earth is rotating. And it rotates to the east. It's a constant um, thing that it is rotating. But the speed itself at which our planet rotates is not constant as you move up and down the globe. Okay? It's the idea that at the equator, that midpoint, that midline of latitude between the North Pole and the South Pole, and if you've got your globe at home, which I know you do, my little geographers, if you don't have one, don't, don't worry about it. But if, if you got one, because you're awesome, um, you can pull it out. You can look at it. But that equator, right, is it's as you're rotating along the equator, it's the idea. Well, here, let me ask you, how long does it take the Earth to make one complete rotation? It rhymes with 24 hours. 24 hours. Perfect. Very good class. Um, so, yeah, it's once every 24 hours, right? That's a, a day. So wherever... You are, whenever you're listening to this, it's the idea that, you know, your relation to the sun and your position on the earth and all that, it's going to take 24 hours to go all the way around and get right back to that same position. Okay, so that means at the equator, with, you know, the whole circumference being 25,000 miles roughly, the whole idea is that wherever you are on the equator at that moment in time, like at, you know, 9 a.m. on a Tuesday, Right, you have to travel twenty five thousand miles around with that rotation to get back to nine a.m. on a Wednesday, right? To be in that same spot, so you got to be booking it. 
you got to move. You got to you got to travel over a thousand miles an hour, right? So the Earth is just flying down at the equator. But at the North Pole or the South Pole, those are dimensionless points, right? Meaning, like if you're at the exact South Pole or the exact North Pole, you're always already there. You're not you're not rotating really anything. You're just you're there. Right? You're in that same position because it's simply a point. So you're traveling zero miles per hour. Okay, So based on these different speeds at which the Earth is rotating, that's, that's deforming the Earth. It's screwing it up. It's centrifugal force is what's doing it. But it's that crazy speed at the equator, nothing going on at the poles. It causes the whole thing to squish. All right, I think I have, yeah, right here. It's the idea that dashed line that we have would be that perfect 360 degree sphere. So that's what the Greeks were thinking about. But that uh, um, you know, pinkish lavenderish color uh, in there, that's the oblate sphere. Now it's not extreme. Um, you can see if you do the math here, it's tiny. It's less than a 1% difference between that equatorial diameter and the polar diameter in there. So you're not gonna notice this from space, right? Like when we look at images of the Earth from space, we don't go, look at that football, right? It looks, it looks beautiful, it's, you know, the blue marble, we, we look at its perfection, but we only see it as being perfect because of our vantage point, how we're viewing it. It's not perfect, it's that squishy ball, right? That's the, that's the idea here. So the Earth, is clearly an oblate spheroid. Um, and this this is just kind of interesting right here where you look at the d different lines of latitude. So 90 degrees, and that could be north or south. That's the either the North Pole or the South Pole. Zero miles per hour, zero kilometers per hour, right? Zero degrees latitude, that's the equator, going over a thousand miles per hour, like I said, so speeding along. Um, if you're, you know, an ABC student listening to this, you're somewhere in the Greater Antelope Valley. Uh, our line of la uh, latitude is, is roughly 34 degrees north where we're at. Um, so, you know, we're roughly traveling 850 miles per hour to the east every single day just to make sure that we get back to that same position the next day in that 24 hours. And usually at this point too, I, I would convince you guys that we can actually feel it and uh, make you get all still, um, put your hand, make you look ridiculous, um, and have you wait in anticipation to feel us flying around, and then I would mock you. Again, safe learning environment, always here to help. But yeah, I would totally mock you guys, um, because you can't feel it uh, at all. There's there's no, again, it's our, it's our own perception, our vantage point, we're these tiny little things right here. That 850 miles per hour or 1,000 miles per hour or whatever doesn't really mean anything to us um, at all on a daily kind of basis as walking around. Like if you're going to run a race, um, if you run to the east instead of the west, you don't get like an 800 mile per hour boost, right? There, there's no difference there with that stuff. So it's happening, but we don't even notice it. And it's why it took somebody like, you know, Newton with his brilliant uh, uh, mind uh, to figure some of this stuff out to help us figure out that the earth is in fact an oblate spheroid except it isn't i mean that's uh, oh it's so cute that you guys think it still is an oblate spheroid no that's garbage garbage it hasn't been an oblate spheroid for years now not at all no it's a geoid you fools uh the earth is a geoid and geoid is one of the greatest terms ever because it means that the Earth is Earth-shaped. That's what that word actually means at the, the root level here. So geoid, it's our way of giving up. Where we basically say, look, the Earth, it is, I mean, look at that picture. It's a potato. It is a lumpy, sad potato that's hanging out in space. You can't fit that to, you know, sphere or spirit or whatever. Geoid. And the great thing is, it will always be a geoid, no matter what we discover, because how could it not be Earth-shaped? right? By default, like it has to be earth shaped because it is the earth. Um, so that's the term we actually use. Now the reason 
I bring this stuff up uh, and take some time with it here is because it is important to realize, A, how our scientific perceptions of the Earth itself have changed, despite the fact that we, you know, we still kind of think of it in terms of it being round. But when you're getting to the point where you're actually making maps, using maps, doing that kind of stuff, where, where geodesy becomes important, we can't simply say it's round, right? Or, or think of it as being perfectly 360 degrees, okay? That's the, the key thing here. Um, so that's number one. But number two, what I'll get into here is, is that this, this idea of the shape of the Earth, this is going to be important for all the stuff we do uh, moving forward in terms of mapping, um, you know, the, the Earth. We need to have a good sense of what the shape of the Earth is in order to be able to map it out, and especially to put it on some flat surface. Okay, that's the, that's the, the issue here. Now, the geoid, it's kind of, it's, it's funky, and I'm not going to make us, I'm not going to make you get into it. I still struggle with some of these concepts with the, the geoid. It's very mathy. Um, then, you know, all of that. I try. Like, I've given up at, at this point. But there are a number of semesters where I'm like, okay, this is the year. I'm going to figure out the geoid and put it into plain English to explain it to my students. And I give up after like five minutes because it's so mathy. Um, but, but it's simply... It's in terms of, of um, the shape of the Earth. We know the Earth, it's a kind of a funky, bumpy thing. We've got high mountain ranges and low trenches and subduction zones in the, um, in the bottom of the ocean and all, and all that. So right off the bat, we've got some things that aren't quite there. But we also know that gravity is doing some different stuff on the, the planet. It's, it's pulling things, affecting Things and not just you know tides and oceans and things like that, but just the Earth itself. It's manipulated in this way. So right off the bat, it's this funky thing. But in terms of mapping, we average everything out. Okay, we we construct the Earth as this fluid thing to help uh, um, just kind of simplify the gravitational pull uh, and all that. Uh, I think I have yeah right here. It's kind of showing some different stuff in here um the main point with all of this is like look the earth it's more complex than we initially thought and you probably initially thought as you're coming in here now this image like so many of these things it's exaggerated same thing with that potato shaped looking planet um it, it's a case where uh, um, we exaggerate it so we can actually see it because if you look at the earth from space you don't see it as this lumpy potato or as an oblate spheroid or any other stuff, this ellipsoid term, that orange dashed line on this image, um, that means oblate spheroid, right? It's, gonna, it's another way of, of saying that. Um, so this is just showing a lot of these different conceptions of the Earth. They don't quite overlap perfectly. So the geoid, in terms of mapping, being a mapping tool, it's, it's an average of some averages that we've done to, to get a model of the Earth that's more true to what's actually happening on the ground. And the result is that means our maps will be all the more accurate. Right? They'll have a better accuracy in terms of representing what the Earth is actually doing. Okay? And this image, I, I like this one, it, it goes to show like how we how we need to conceive of the stuff, the visual representation that helps us make sense of stuff. So on the left here, it's showing this like relief globe idea so we can see differences in elevation, all right? So you can see not just South America, but the Andes mountain range right there and the Rockies coming up here and, and uh, all that. Uh, they highlight the Hawaiian Islands um, as being these you know mountains erupting out of there. But in reality... All this stuff is barely a blip, right? When we look at the entire planet. So this is, again, getting back to that idea. When you look at the Earth from space, it doesn't look like a geoid. It doesn't look funky in any way. It looks like that perfect 360-degree sphere, but we know it isn't because we've been able to map. We've been able to map this stuff quite well, and a lot of that comes from GPS. 
which we'll be getting into in this class and how that actually works. But GPS has advanced a lot of our knowledge, and we needed a good knowledge of geodesy to be able to put uh, GPS stuff, you know, together to, to start the system. But it's in turn, it's helped us figure out and measure stuff in ways that we have not been able to before. So the past, you know, I don't know, three or four decades, we've really really gotten a better idea of how dynamic the earth is, how it changes constantly, all that. And it just means we can make better maps. And I'll be getting into as well, like when we really start getting into projections and coordinate systems and some of that stuff, I'll get into this concept of datum. Um, plural would be data, which is kind of confusing, but it's, it's a datum. It's this origin point based on Either the geoid or this ellipsoid idea or, or stuff like that. So when it comes to selecting proper maps and making maps, especially having this understanding of the geoid and all that, it, it's important to have. Now this image, this is a it took us from from ESRI's website. They're the company that makes um, the kind of the leading GIS software, um, which we're not going to get to really play with in this class because we're not in the classroom, um, you know, doing this stuff, assuming you're listening to this during our, our COVID pandemic classes and, and um, it's not just a, you know, regular online version or something like that. Um, but, but this is, so using that mapping software, this is mapping the weird gravitational stuff at work that goes into our conception of the geoid. And so what you can see is that it's, you know, the different colors are, are showing different values here but what you can see it's not just consistent with you know oceans are doing this one thing lands doing another thing gravity is affecting the entire planet and what's cool with this too is that as people have started to map it they can also play around um with this so this um i believe this one is as if the earth um were a perfect sphere i don't know the methodology behind this exactly i just stole it because it amuses me um but it's the idea that if we were this perfect sphere, the blue is where the oceans would be. So this is what the planet would look like. You'd have some land at the, the north and at the south, and then a big ocean around the belt. And what I love about this um, is that if you look at, at some of this stuff, kind of hard to, to see here, but what I'm really seeing is that like basically the Antelope Valley would be like the Florida Keys of this uh, um new uh, uh world right here right which i think is that's something to think about los angeles santa barbara all these sexy places underwater garbage um but out here in the animal valley we're going to survive and be and be glorious if you know if the earth ever were to become a perfect 360 degree sphere this one the opposite is what would happen if um um the rotation were to uh stop if we weren't rotating, now it's the opposite where we've got oceans at the north and south and this belt of land. And again, we're, we're, we're peeking out right here. We're, we're okay. Now we're more like the, you know, Monterey or Santa Cruz or whatever of uh, this new reality. Regardless of, of, of what happens, the Antelope Valley will survive. We're, we're like cockroaches. We, um, we will never go away. So, you know, feel free, feel free to buy, uh, buy land out here. Um, good investment. Good investment. All right. Okay. And so as I was saying, the GPS stuff, this has really helped us figure out what's going on with, with the earth in terms of the shape and positions and locations. And I'll spend more time. I'll get into exactly how this works. But the cool thing is with the right kind of GPS technology, you can get down to centimeter level accuracy yeah your phone can't do that the garmin handheld and stuff like that they can't do that they can't get that uh good in terms of um accuracy here um but but with survey grade stuff military grade stuff things that you know sadly cost many thousands of dollars are outside of uh, the reach for most just normal people but when you're doing scientific work mapping work and survey stuff you're able to get that level of accuracy, which is incredible. So we can tell, like when there's an earthquake, we can really see what happens, how the earth changes, because we can measure stuff down to that centimeter level 
accuracy. So if during a big earthquake, the earth shifts, say, you know, 30, 40 centimeters, um, you know, half a you know, meter even, like whatever it might be, depending on what's going on and how close you are to the fault, we can record that really well. So our, our just our maps and our understanding of where stuff is come a long way because of GPS. Okay, now I'm going to shift a, a little bit here. We got the, the shape of the Earth, which is a what? Geoid. Very good, Klaus. Um, but now we need to get into this idea of direction. So I've talked about a little bit like how the Greeks used, you know, winds and stuff like that. But what we're going to use um, is the, the cardinal direction based on magnetic north and, and you know, latitude and longitude too. We'll, we'll get into different types of north as well because that can get funky. But the general idea is we, we need to, you know, keep straight north, east, south, west. Okay, just those basics right there. So we've got this old-timey compass rose thing going on. The fleur-de-lis uh, right there is, is a standing for north for whatever reason, probably a French thing. Um, but so when you see that, that, that means north. Um, and it's at the top, right? Thanks to the Greeks. Um, but you need to keep this in mind, this idea of, of north. If north is at the top, where east is, where south is, where west is, in relation, okay? Because we're going to be using that. And for most students, you know, north and south, you can get those opposites, but what screws them up is the east-west thing. So there's an easy way to remember this. There are all sorts of little sayings, but if you start with north at the top, and of course you have to work clockwise, right, for this to work, because if you go counterclockwise, you're going to screw the whole thing up. But what I always teach my students, some of you have already heard this, you already know this, it's already changed your life for the better, um, but go ahead and say it with me. Um, so we start with north and we say never, you say never, ever, right, e, ever, east, right, so never, ever smoke weed, all right, you're welcome for that, all right, pass on grass, don't do drugs, kids. Um, this is a, a saying, there are a bunch of different ones, like never eat soggy waffles or shredded wheat or whatever. No, this is garbage. Um, this is something I didn't even come up with. This a student um, taught me this one. He was in a lab class I was teaching, and uh, God, I loved the guy. He just he would do it. Never ever smoke weed. And like when we we're working on maps or lab activities or whatever, he would repeat it. All right, he would be down like never ever smoke weed. Never ever smoke weed. Where it was like he was trying to remember his east and his west and where this stuff was. But I think he was always also trying to like get his life back on track. Right, trying to, to make sure that he, he didn't he didn't you know go into the, the that, that cloud of, of drug smoke uh, and ruin his life uh, and all that. So there you go. You see, you, you remember never ever smoke weed. You're set for life. You are gonna be okay. Uh, okay, so that's so keep that in mind because we're gonna use this. We're gonna have as we're working with maps and different types of maps and all that. It's gonna be important to be able to say. North versus east, south, west, like to know where these things are. And then from there, things like northeast, you know, it's just halfway in between north and east. We've got northeast and then halfway in between northeast and east. We have east, northeast, and it gets, it gets crazy. And honestly, unless you're like some pirate, you don't need to know all this stuff. And this is also why I mentioned azimuth, like in our first class meeting, this is why azimuth is so useful. You don't have to say something like east, north, east and really think about, you know, what is that actually saying? And, and you can even be more precise. You can say something like 70 degrees, right? 68 degrees, 72 degrees or whatever and have that. Um, it's, it's just for me anyway. It's an easier way to think about that. So we'll play around with azimuth when we get to that point. But for now, just keep your north, east, south, west. Keep that in mind. Um, let's see, we talked about the wind stuff with the Greeks, the Romans did it too. Don't worry about it. Compass, yeah, we'll get to it. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, but now, what I want to, you know, finish this stuff up with is this idea of location. Okay, we know we got our geoid, um, and we can say, okay, north and, and south, and so we can decide, okay, this, this is going to be the, you know, north. This is going to be the top. Right of our um, geoid here, um, but really, how do we know where to put that top? Because my God, I mean, and let's go back. Let's forget about the geoid. Let's talk about a sphere. 
if we're dealing with a perfect sphere, there's no top to that, right? And don't even use like the basketball example or baseball or whatever, because those you can, based on the seams and the logos and stuff, you can, you know, have some kind of reference. But if you just have a perfectly smooth, plain sphere, you can't say this is the top, this is the bottom. You can't find location on there, right? So you need something else. And so what we use for the most part is that grid, right? Ptolemy's grid, which we technically call the graticule. Or we can just say latitude and longitude. And there are other ways of putting grids on here. We'll get into that stuff. But I'm just going to start with latitude and longitude. So this graticule, it's an imaginary. I have that highlighted here because I always want to remind you it's something some Greek dude came up with. It's not like if you're out sailing in the, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean, you're not going to run into lines that say like 30 degrees west or, or whatever. Right, and we know that we know, haha, that's foolish. Um, but we do kind of tend to think that it's just it's natural, um, but it's not. All right, that's the, the key thing. But so, the graticule it's this imaginary grid that covers the surface of the earth, right? And so, we have lines of longitude, lines of latitude. So, what I'm going to get into here is how we figure that stuff out. All right, um, now what we traditionally do is with latitude and longitude, we report it in this DMS system, okay, which stands for degrees, minutes, seconds. Okay? These are fractions. That's what we're dealing with. Uh, and you know, keep in mind, this came was uh, uh, originated in ancient Greece before we had computers and spreadsheets and, and things like that. So we'll talk about like computers don't really like to think in terms of you know degrees, minutes, seconds, we have other ways of, of dealing with that stuff. But the original concept, and what you'll see on a lot of paper maps, like the, the ones that we'll be using quite often, is you have this, this system here. So we have 360 degrees around a sphere. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but why do we care about spheres? You just told me all that was nonsense, uh, that it's, you know, we're geoid. And blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I know I, what I told you. Uh, and we are a geoid, but this whole system was come up with, it was, was developed when, uh, um, you know, the Greeks thought it was a perfect sphere. So everything's in this 360 degrees. Now things have been adjusted to, you know, where when you have a, a GPS and maps and all that, it's all connected to the geoid now. So we're just going to go with the assumption that everything's a sphere, right? Um, so go with it. Just be cool, right? 360 degrees around a sphere. Um, so that's our, our perfect sphere idea. But uh, the distance from one degree to the next, that's, uh, that's pretty massive. And it turns out there's a lot of stuff in between, say, one degree north and two degrees north, right? Or one degree east and two degrees east or, or whatever. So we want to divide up these degrees. And we divide them up into minutes, which is confusing as can be. Because minutes makes us think of clocks, right? Um, but uh, it's, it's not. It's a, it's a division of a round thing. If you want to um, you want to think of it that way, right? So <clears throat> uh, it's 60 minutes. It's simply 1 60th of a degree, okay? So in between 1 degree north and 2 degrees north, we divide that, that space right there into 60 equally sized minutes. You follow? Hopefully you follow. Um, hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. We'll work through it. Just kind of go with the general idea. We're going to get plenty of um, practice with this stuff. Okay, so every degree is divided up into 60 minutes in that degree, although there can still be you know, one minute is a big amount of area, so we further divide each minute into 60 seconds. Which again, has nothing to do with time and is confusing and, and all of that, but 60 seconds, that's simply 1 60th of a minute. Okay, so when we see stuff um, recorded here, I don't think we have anything good example. See, and this, again, if we were in class, I'd be drawing stuff on the whiteboard and all that. And yeah, I know there... 
ways I could be very technologically technologically um, savvy um, and and you know have like a little screen here with my face and I could hold up a whiteboard and all that. I ain't got time for that right well we'll we'll figure it out this is what our like our Zoom meetings and stuff are for okay but it, it's the idea again that with all these you know we're just seeing degrees right here you know and not even every single one just specific ones like the 49th parallel that refers to 49 degrees north latitude but in between 49 degrees north and 50 degrees north we can divide that into 60 equal minutes right um so if i said you know i'm at 49 degrees 30 minutes if you think about that write it down if you need to um what the what I'm saying here is it's basically it's 49 and a half degrees, right? I'm halfway between 49 degrees north and 50 degrees north, right? So that's what 30 minutes means because it's 30 out of 60. If we reduce our fraction right there, which I know you guys love the fractions, um, you know, it'd be one half, right? 30 over 60, it simplifies to one half. And what we what we do in the age of computers is we convert all this stuff into decimals. And so you'll also see this, it's called decimal degrees. Uh, and so this is, um, you know, instead of saying 49 degrees, 30 minutes north, we'd say 49.5 degrees north, right? Or you'll see, like if you play around with stuff online, um, you move your cursor around, it'll give you like 49.623746, right? Some number like that. And what that's doing is it's it's converting not just the minutes but the seconds to a decimal okay to make it easier for computers and analysis and, and stuff like that that's what we're we're looking at and you guys are going to get some practice with the old degrees minutes seconds stuff i have a thing i'm going to give you for you to to fill out here um but that's okay so that's what we we got going on here um now with these lines so that was that was this here right with this latitude, latitude is a specific set of these grid lines. So the latitude lines are the ones that are running from east to west. Or if we look at a map or the globe or whatever, if we look at it with north oriented to the top, then they're going to be the horizontal lines that we have. That's latitude. Okay, so on this globe here, what we're seeing, like this one's got the chunk taken out to, to show you something there. But if we focus on this bottom one right here, these horizontal lines that are running around the earth, these are lines of latitude. And we can also call them parallel lines because they are in fact parallel. So the 49th parallel means the 49th uh, line of uh, latitude. And this is actually this is garbage um, because it should also be the 49th parallel north right, or the north 49th parallel, because there's also a 49th parallel um, south, right? We start everything at the equator, which is this darker line right here. That's zero degrees. That's the equator, and it's perfectly in between the north pole and the south pole. So we start there with zero, and then we start counting north or south, right? So the lines run east to west. They're drawn from east to west or horizontally, but they're counting north or south coordinates. So with latitude and longitude, if you have something like say 49 degrees and it has a north or a south at the end of it, you're dealing with latitude. Okay, and we'll get into longitude, that's the other one in a minute, but that's, that's what latitude is. And so what, and going back to the, like the chunk with, with this, so what it's trying to show is that there's there's actual math behind these numbers. It's not just make believe stuff, arbitrary numbers or whatever. Uh, if you cut the Earth in half, like we have right here, so we we've cut it in half and we're looking in the the you know inside of it, right? Um, you draw a line from one end of the equator to the other. Everything else here, the different latitude that we have, it's it's based off of the actual angle, right? So like Kyoto, Japan, right here, it's at 35 degrees north because if you were to draw this, this line from one end of the equator to the other, 
and a line from Kyoto down to the center, it's a 35 degree angle. Therefore, it's at 35 degrees north. Sao Paulo, Brazil, 23 degrees south. Okay, so if we look at the North Pole, what's the latitude value there? What's the latitude of the North Pole? I'll wait for you to shout into your laptop or phone or, or whatever. Did you shout 90? Hopefully you did. Yeah, it's at, the North Pole is at 90 degrees. And if you just shouted 90, you know, shame on you. It's, it's horribly wrong uh, because it's 90 degrees what? North, right? Because the South Pole is 90 degrees south. And it's very important whenever you're dealing with latitude and longitude to make sure you're writing down that direction, right? Because if you just put 90 degrees, well, I don't know if I do know it's latitude. I don't know if you're talking about the North Pole or the South Pole, but I also, it could be a longitude as well. There are four different options for what you're dealing with if you don't put North, East, South, West, whatever is supposed to be there, right? So make sure you always do that, okay? Always have that direction uh, added there. And then here's another image kind of showing that idea of the equator being in the middle. I'd be pointing to stuff if we were in a classroom if you guys needed more of this stuff. But like I said, it will, we'll have practice with this. Hopefully it will make sense. Um, and then after we get through all this too, spoiler alert, I'm gonna tell you guys like, look, that's how this stuff works. It's important to know. But honestly, if you're doing actual field work, so few people I've ever worked with use latitude and longitude. If you're doing real research in the field, because it sucks to, to use, um, there are other systems in place that we'll get into. So I want you guys to know it because you need that base knowledge. But we'll get into some stuff that I think, frankly, is way easier. And in part, it's because you don't need to remember these directions and deal in terms of 360 and angles and, and all that stuff, right? So stick with it, and, and then we'll we'll get past it and we'll get to the good stuff in future weeks. All right, so that's um, that's that. I'm yeah, I'm not gonna do this stuff with with you guys here. It's just there are some lines of of latitude, like we see here, that they're they're not just places um, that we've we've mapped here they're connected to seasons and the sun and so you'll see this like especially on a globe or old-timey world maps you'll see a lot of this tropic of cancer antarctic circle that kind of stuff it has to do with seasonality and it's also an important thing for navigation and, and that kind of stuff if you want to learn more about this take the 101 class from me if you if you haven't we're going to move on because it's not going to be necessary for what it is we're we're going to be doing all right um also this idea of finding one's latitude yeah, no we do that in other classes i'm not gonna do that all right i'm not i'm not gonna train you guys to be sailors who uh have no you know gps equipment but carry a sextant with you at, at all times so i'm gonna skip through this stuff um I mean, it's you know, it's kind of cool, but again, we don't we don't have sextants. We're not we're not gonna play around um, with this stuff. All right, but you can again, you want to get into it. My one on one class, um, yeah, we get into that stuff there. All right, so let's move on. And yeah, army guys, we're gonna move on with that. No, we'll, we'll skip that. I'm getting tired. My my voice is hurting. Let's let's move on. Let's get into what longitude is. Trying to get the hell out of here, right? Okay, so longitude. This is our other set of lines. Um, and so with these, they're running the opposite direction. Our latitude lines were horizontal. Again, if we're assuming north is at the top and all that. So these would be the vertical lines. We're going off that idea. And what we really do is we draw these lines from one end of our axis to the other. Okay? And the axis is this imaginary, well, it's not imaginary, it means there, but it's invisible. It's not like an actual thing. It's not like some big red line that's going through the center of the Earth. Um, but it's that that uh, axis around which we rotate, right? So the actual spinning that's going on, we, we rotate on an axis, and we use the North Pole, where that spits out, and the South Pole, where it spits out in the South. We use that to draw our longitude lines. Okay, so what we're looking at, right here. So we've got latitude A on the left, 
over here. Longitude is B, and so you can see where it gets dark up here, where it all comes together, that's the North Pole. Uh, so all of these lines meet up there, which means that these are not parallel lines, okay? Because they do intersect at a certain point, okay? And that's why they also, longitude behaves a little differently, the values can be different, all that, I'll get into how that works. But so that's what our longitude lines are. They're these vertical ones, are the ones that run north-south, but they measure east and west of our origin point right here, okay? And see, what this is showing is, of course, all this stuff is useless if you don't put these things together. So I'm talking about them separately to help this make sense. Um, but if you simply say, you know, 40 degrees north, I mean, that's great. That's a start. But you could literally be anywhere around the planet. You know, you're just at this specific parallel, right? But if I say 40 degrees north and 60 degrees west, right, then where those things intersect so 40 degrees north here, 60 degrees west. I know that I'm talking about that specific point, right? So you need both to be able to know exactly where you are or where you want to get to or, or whatever, all right? So longitude, there's a few more things on this. Because they're not parallel, we can't also call them parallels, but we do call them meridians, all right? Which is just, it's just another word for longitude. And what... Um, cool thing about meridians is that they're they're also great circles meaning that if you you know draw let me see how i can explain this here so like this if this is our earth right here and again we're assuming it's a perfect sphere we're just we're working in this kind of perfection idea here if you were to make like this plane right like a, a sheet of paper to, to go through or a blade to, you know, go through or whatever, if you cut through the earth along these meridians, it would produce a great circle, meaning that it would cut the earth completely in half, into two perfect halves, okay? And what that is, is it's actually the shortest distance between two points on a sphere. Now, this will become important when we get into projections and some stuff later on, but it's the idea that if you follow a line of longitude, right, to get from point A to, to point B, um, that's going to be the shortest distance. Or if you follow a line of, a line of latitude, that's not necessarily the shortest distance, right? We tend to think, like what we learn early on in math classes or whatever, is the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. No, that works if you're working on graph paper abstractly in a geometry classroom. But when we're dealing with the Earth and maps, and we'll get into that complexity uh, a little later, um, a straight line between point A and point B, uh, not necessarily the shortest distance. Okay, Meridians, though, they would be. So you know if you're following a line of longitude, it's going to be the shortest distance, the easiest way to get there. Okay, so I just bring that up now. We'll talk about this in a few weeks when we get into map projections and how these things work. Um, here's this is show this is why these things can be so convoluted. Um, and here is because distances aren't always the same between you know one degree here like this. Even with our our concept of our parallel lines, our lines of latitude. What this is showing is, uh, you know, the distance um, between one degree at the equator or at, you know, around 10 degrees north or 20 degrees north or 70 or whatever. If this was truly perfect, it would all be the same. It's close, but it's not. And so that can be confusing when you need to measure between two degrees. It, it, position plays a big role. The whole point of this, you don't need to memorize this stuff or know it or, or whatever even, but this is why I'm going to introduce other coordinate systems, other grids to you guys, because oh, there's just, this is archaic and there's a lot going on. It's not the best way to map the the earth, right? But that said, it's it's one of the oldest ways we got. It's, it's what we got to learn. All right, now another thing, key thing to mention here, with longitude is it has its own origin point. It's zero degrees uh, 
longitude, okay? And then from there, we draw lines of longitude one degree to the east, one degree to the west, and we continue on, okay? Now, the, the zero degree longitude line, we call it the prime meridian, okay? Like the first meridian or the starting point. That's what it's, it's saying, right? The, the starting line of longitude. Now, the prime meridian runs through Greenwich, England. It looks like Greenwich. It's pronounced Greenwich because they're Brits. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's how you say it. All right? So it goes through Greenwich, England. This is our zero line. Uh, and it's good to know that, like, the equator, that zero line of latitude, that makes sense. That's the halfway point between North Pole, South Pole. That's, that's natural, right? That starting point. The prime meridian... This specific one, anyway, um, but all of them throughout history, there's nothing natural about this stuff. It runs through Greenwich, um, which it's like a suburb of London, if you want to think of it that way. It's outside of London so the, because there was an observatory. And there's a whole story about why the observatory's there. There's a guy trying to impress a lady and, you know, build her an observatory and blah, 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 blah. Um, so you got that stuff going on. But it, only, it runs through England. Because England was this mighty superpower when this stuff was being figured out. Like, this is ancient Greek stuff, but to be able to actually use it, that would take centuries before we could actually figure this stuff out. Um, and so it just happened to be England was the powerhouse when this stuff was really figured out. And so that's why it runs through there. If we figured this stuff out today... You know, it'd be it'd be based off of Washington D.C. or something like that, right? And if you go back further, it, it could be Madrid, where this is, or even further, it, you know, it could be I don't know Medina or you know wherever. You, you get what I'm saying, right? So it's an arbitrary thing, but it's good to know it starts in England, and so from there, then we have a little uh, diagram here. We're looking down, all right? Keep that in mind. So orient yourselves here. The North Pole. It's in the center of this disk. So it's like we're hovering above the Earth, directly above the North Pole. Okay, Our prime meridian, we draw from the North Pole all the way down to the South Pole. So that's our zero degrees. And they say London here, but again, it's technically Greenwich, but close enough. right? It's, it's like getting you know, hung up on L.A. and Burbank or, or whatever. Okay, So that's, that's what we got here. And then from here, as I said, we measure a degree to the west, a degree to the east, and it goes all the way around and then meets back at 180 degrees. Okay? And this is another example of direction being important. We don't use it for the prime meridian or for this 180 degree line because there's only one, so it's neither east nor west. Same thing with the equator and latitude. Um, it's just zero degrees latitude. It doesn't need to be <laughs> or it can't really be north or, or south there. But the same thing here. So the prime meridian is at zero degrees, but it is important to put a west or an east, a W or an E, so we know the difference. All right? Because you can see 90 degrees west and 90 degrees east are literally on opposite sides of the earth. So if you simply said 90 degrees longitude, really not helpful at all. That's not telling me what I need to know. Okay? So that's that's the concept here. That's a, another key thing is we're working with this stuff. And then that 180 degrees, and we go back here to the simple thing, this is where longitude meets. So we kind of think of it as it, it stops here. But what we've done is we've made this, this is our international date line. Okay, It technically follows 180 degrees longitude or the 180th mer meridian, right? Is this this image shows. Uh, and so what that does is this is our starting point or ending point for the day. Because again, we're dealing with this round earth. It can be confusing to you know top, bottom, start, finish, that kind of stuff when it comes to rotation. So we just, we decided we're going to make it um, out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? That's the idea. And technically, you know, it's 180 degrees, but technically the, this red line is the actual international dateline and it looks funky because it turns out I mean yeah we say it's on the middle of the ocean nobody lives out there it turns out actually a lot of people live out there it's just not the kind of people who typically have a say in um, this kind of stuff so you have a lot of island nations 
this image here, this is from a, uh, uh, it's a series of maps I did for a history book. And it was a great gig. And I may, depending on, we'll see how it works. I may incorporate some of this stuff um, into this class to have you work with some of it. Because I, I took the job. Well, mainly because I, I like the historian and was, was happy to do it. But, uh, um, but it also it's a case of it was, I realized how little I knew about what was going on in the, you know, in the Pacific Ocean with these islands. And it is fascinating to see tiny little, you know, nations and, and territories, but to, to learn about the people there. And, and the stuff I'll share with you guys is kind of frustrating. There are like no maps that really exist or good maps that exist, but there are some government records and you have latitude and longitude coordinates in there. And so we'll get into how we, we take latitude and longitude coordinates from government documents and how we're able to turn that into a map or how to do something with it. So I'll share that with you guys um, as we as we move on in the class, as we get into some of that data stuff. Um, but yeah, so we have, if you look at the, the lines here, you can see this little funky part right here, and it kind of matches some of the actual territory stuff out there. And so the idea is... You have, you know, effectively like, uh, um, you know, Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands, because they're a U.S. state, we lump them on this side of the date line with the rest of the United States so that it's all, it all makes sense. It all, you know, works together. It'd be confusing if Hawaii was always a day ahead of us, right? So we don't do that. Same thing with the Aleutian Islands, with Alaska, the things that actually stretch past that 180 degree line, we just say, look whatever, you're, you're going to still be with us because that'd be extra confusing to have a day change and, you know, within the same state, right? Let alone the same country. But then you've got uh, folks over here where we bring this over. These nations do more business or are connected with the people on the other side of the international date line. So you can see with, uh, with latitude, you know, in general, that's very connected to nature. Longitude, that's social. It's it's political. It's all connected to people. Just another thing to keep in mind as we're working with it. It doesn't always make sense, right? That's the that's the real thing to take uh, uh, from this stuff. All right. So yeah, we saw that. And the finding longitude. This is interesting. You know, figuring out if you're out at sea sailing around, how you figure this stuff out. I'm not gonna make you guys do this. Because we're not pirate class. Um, so, yeah, same. Blah, 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 blah. There's some math. How exciting. This guy, Harrison, his chronometer. Skip that. Um, all right. So the, the main point, as I already said earlier, we work with these things together. So to find a specific location on the, uh, on the globe, right, on our geoid or whatever, if you have a line of latitude and a line of longitude, you can find that point, all right? So it's the idea, if I give you, hint, hint, which is what I'll be doing in, in future, um, uh, you know, maybe this week, maybe next week, I don't know exactly when, but I'll, I'll give you things like, hey, here are some, you know, coordinates. It's at this latitude, this longitude. Where is it on the map that I provide to you, all right? That's the... Um, the idea here, um, you know, what you do is knowing, okay, latitude of these lines, longitude of these lines, you're going to be reading the different sets of lines here. And whatever latitude value I give you, you're going to be trying to figure that out. Okay, is it north or south of the equator? You know, if it's north, how, how much north? If it's, you know, 45, it would be halfway in between this 40 and 50. That's another thing to think about. Because there's so much going on here, we can't always... Um, you know, draw every single latitude line or longitude line or whatever. So you have to figure it out, you know, deduce from what's what's already existing there, work from the known to the unknown. So if I give you 45 degrees north, it'd be halfway in between 40 and 50, right? And if I gave you 48 degrees north, you'd know it's it's between these two, but it's closer to 50, right? That's the That's the idea. And that's, frankly, that's the best you can do with what we're doing. I don't expect you to measure stuff out with a ruler and, and do all that. Just eyeball uh, a lot of this stuff. And then so you know it's okay. It's somewhere in between here and then the longitude. If I say it's, you know, 56 degrees west, you know it's somewhere in between here. And so where those two lines intersect, 
That's your actual point, right? That's how you work with this stuff, or at least that's what we'll be doing to start with. And what we'll also be doing is we'll be taking this from that we're not going to work with globes, mainly because we're not in a, a classroom right now. Not, uh, I'm not expecting you guys to go and buy globes to do this stuff because, frankly, globes are kind of useful for educational purposes, but not not much else you can do with them. Although they look they look sexy, you can just have it on a bookshelf or whatever. I'll I'll give you that. Um, but we'll be doing it on a flat map, and so you'll really start to see how this whole coordinate system idea works, right? That it's just this x and y axis. It's like a grid that you've, you know, the graphing and, and mapping, plotting stuff out you've done in math classes before. Um, it's just, it's just in the, you know, in the real world. It'll have a slightly different vibe. Okay, so hopefully that stuff all makes some sense to you. I'll be working with you guys on this stuff, but all these things here I've just been rambling about for the past however long I've been rambling about it. This is all important stuff. Um, and we'll keep practicing with it and make sure you guys get it. All right? All right. Have fun with that, geographers. Until we meet again.